Hey everyone, and welcome to another Yogi Misfit Sessions. My name is Danny Pomploon, and I'm your host. Today I'm coming at you with session 67, and I am super humbled and honored to uh, have spoken with Sri Dharma Mitra on this session. I first heard him speak a few years back. This is before I was a full-time yoga teacher um, at a yoga journal conference and was really just touched and moved by his words and started following him uh, just lightly. And then turns out a couple of uh, my favorite teachers here in San Francisco um, are big students of him. So I got to dive deeper into that uh, connection, which is super cool. And, and I got to talk to him some more. Um, he is such an awesome and powerful man. He has a great story of how he went from becoming a bodybuilder into yoga and how he took his practice of yoga um, and, and shared it with the world. And now he's got an awesome center in New York. So it's just uh, incredible to be able to speak to him. It was, it was really touching and moving. And Tribe, I wanted to take a second out to tell you about my absolute favorite yoga mat. It's called Lifeform. It really is the best yoga mat out on the market. It's actually the only thing that I choose to practice on and the only thing I recommend to other people. Now, the cool thing about their mats is they're 100% eco-friendly and they're ethically sourced. The other thing about it is it's one of the grippiest mats I've ever practiced on, but they have this really cool intelligent marker system that they call the Align For Me system. So it helps you get your body situated, whether you're going into a down dog or into Warrior One or Warrior Two. It is super freaking rad. Again, this is the only mat I choose to practice on. Check out their website, and if you do want to buy something, you can use the code DANNYP2019 to get 10% off. Again, that's Danny P 2019 and you get 10% off. Enjoy this mat just as much as I do. As always, I'd like to remind you guys that leaving a review on iTunes really helps support the show. It takes a couple quick seconds and there's a little link down below that tells you how to do it, but it really helps the show grow and lets more people know about the show so we can uh, share the yoga love. And without further ado, here comes the interview with Sri Dharma Mitra. Sri Dharma, it's such an honor to be speaking to you today. It is a pleasure for me to share some of the wisdom of yoga. You have such an incredible story. I, um, I remember I first met you. Um, a few years ago at a yoga journal conference, and I got to hear you speak and was very much moved. Um, and now two of my teachers here in San Francisco are students of yours, uh, Stephanie Snyder and Martin Scott. So I've been able to follow your teachings for quite a while now. And it's, again, just such a pleasure to have you uh, today. So I'd love to hear a little more about how you went from becoming a uh, bodybuilding champion um, to studying yoga. Well, since young, I was looking for something amazing. Start from the physical. I want to be practicing gymnastics or bodybuilding. At that time, bodybuilding was available. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't have much of the spiritual knowledge, except some, uh, some level of compassion to the animals. But I knew before all that, I want to know something eternal. Where am I going? Is there reincarnation? But anyway, I started doing bodybuilding with all my power. And gradually, within three or four years, I reach almost the peak, but not there yet. <laughs> I was able to win a state title, Miss State Dharma, and also a lifting, second place on lifting. I was really happy with the physical part, but that I knew. Someone came to me once and told me, the bodybuilders are 
very big in body, but their brain is very small, like a mustard seed. I was mm. angry over that. <laughs> <laughs> in the scriptures that ignorant man grows inside, in size, <laughs> not, not in spirit. And that trick is something else in, you, in my mind to start practicing yoga. And when you started practicing, did it come natural for you or did you feel like it was hard to understand the teachings? First, I had a trial. I had a younger brother who had a yoga book. And this book deals with the state of bliss, the state of samadhi. And that mm. triggers me. When I read the first page, I said to myself, this is what I want. This is, is real for me. I will do my best to find a guru. And then I start doing only through the books, the practice, not the asanas. But then I realize I must find a guru. And my young brother came to the United States in 1962 and found a guru. And after two years, his invite me to come here to meet the Guru. And that, for me, was like meeting God. <laughs> well, I mean, was the beginning and the beginning of, of the end of suffering. <laughs> and that's when you started studying in New York with Yogi Gupta, correct? That's right, Swami Kalashananda, or Yogi Gupta. <laughs> How long did you study with Yogi Gupta? Since I came here, I became a full time. I never miss his classes. My brother has to do all the translation for me. I'm mm. 64. And almost every day attending all the classes as much as I can. And after three years or so, my English was just enough to run a Hatha Yoga class. So I kept studying with him until 1975. In 1975, I noticed that what I always wanted, I already knew it, and I decided to leave the ashram. This ashram was right here on 56th Street, near Lexington Avenue. My English at that time was a little bit enough to start talking about my experiences and about the truth about yoga. And in 1975, I left the yoga center and opened a, my first studio. And my guru was really happy and said to me, all right, my son, do your best. And is that when you founded the first uh, Dharma Yoga Center in New York? Yes, the name was the Yoga Asana Center, and then we changed the name after a few more years. How, how did it all come about? How did it start to grow into what it is today? Amazing. At that time, not many people was interested in yoga. But I had my tricks, my inner intuition, some advice of the Yoga Gupta. And my, I start my classes 
with $1.50 for a class. Most of the classes was two hours for two hours. Mm -hmm. And within a week or so, I had already lots of people. And now you have tons of students still. Yeah, now increasing gradually. I think it's um, it's interesting to hear you say that your English wasn't so good because now I know that in your classes you're extremely funny and you always tell jokes. <laughs> I still have some problem with my English. <laughs> I talk too much except talking about yoga. <laughs> and the students today are I'm more, how to say, more spiritual. We attract gradually another, another uh, type of students as this, the teacher get more knowledge, more light, automatically he attracts students who are serious about it and seeking self-knowledge. I know one of the things that you are extremely passionate about is seeing compassion as an essential component of anyone undertaking life in general. Can you speak a little more to that and how it is so important and how vital it is to bring it into your life? As I said in the beginning, even before yoga, I was already born with some, a little bit of compassion towards the animals, towards my friends and relatives, and a little bit towards beyond my pets, too, up to a limit. But with lots of experience, and knowledge from the scriptures, even from the Lord Buddha, I realize that compassion, the ethical conduct, is the foundation of everything. As, you, as one becomes more compassionate towards all things, we have to go beyond our relatives and friends and pets. We have the action of compassion I realize is to see myself and others. That is mm. the first step of <clears throat> self-realization. How do you think people can start to bring bring that into their own practice? By knowing that all beings love life. All beings are like us. They fear violence. They want to be happy. They want to be raised family like us. They fear violence. By realizing that, automatically one becomes more compassionate and that generates one of the powers of yoga by becoming ethically civilized automatically we become more sensitive to sense subtle we call it spiritual we almost can sense that there is God, this intelligence, or this luminous self, the cause of all this universe. We can sense it. We just feel it. When we read the scriptures, we almost can sense the meaning of the verses. It's not believing because we just sense it. That is the power of compassion. With this, we develop more 
enthusiasm, more obedience to our teaching. If, if, if someone was to ask you, you know, from the sacred text, what would be your most important or where would be a great place for someone to start in your, um, in your, in your teachings? First, we have to choose the right scriptures. I recommend that everyone should have the Yoga Sutras or the Bhagavad Gita, because there we can gradually learn how to become compassionate how to become self-controlled, how it is important to be obedient to your teacher. And then with obedience and reverence to the teacher, one gradually, after a long time of the study of the scriptures, one is ready for higher scriptures like the end of the Yoga Sutra, the Raja Yoga, one will be able to get ready for self-knowledge. But one first should cultivate obedience, respect to all beings, cleanliness. The first and second step of yoga is the best for a beginner. Read Yama and Niyama. Niyama has Atma Bodha. After keeping Yama properly, one will be able to go through or get ready for Atma Bodha, self-knowledge, the foundation. You can get it anywhere, online. <laughs> I am God. <laughs> that really talks about Yama. I have one little book too. <laughs> so go and get Yama and Niyama. I think in the modern day, what we see in the practice, a lot of people are very attracted to the physical, but they forget that yoga is more than just asana. There are a lot of steps that go before that. That's right. Most people is like that. They want to achieve radiant health, some mental powers. Even their meditation is not towards self-realization, just so that one feels spiritually nice, able to cope with situation with some understanding. So in the beginning, everyone has to get healthy and get some self-control. And remember the foundation you must be obedient to your teacher. Eventually, with constant presence, to be together with the teacher, you will automatically develop a desire for self-realization. So today, we have to get healthy with some mental power, and then, so we first st first start by being healthy in the mind and in the body in order to get that with the discipline of a teacher. Become healthy by gradually adopting a vegetarian diet, and then becoming vegan, and then you really will never see a doctor, and with just become vegan automatically you feel good. And by keeping a little bit of the compassion, it brings us this inner peace and joy, harmony with all beings. 
and all the others will come gradually. Remember, the Ashtanga Yoga is the seven steps of yoga. And gradually one gets healthy, physical powers, mental powers, and spiritual powers. These three powers, in the beginning, one may be able to succeed in your career, to become a better doctor, to become a better householder, to become or succeed in politics, or to anything you like. If you have these powers, you may succeed on anything here. And those who are seeking liberation, when I say those, only all the souls seeking that. <laughs> no matter. You put a cave man he does it and put him to do yoga here for a hundred years, he's still, <laughs> he's still, <laughs> his compassion cannot go beyond his mommy. <laughs> It's like having real, real life superpowers. Right. And how do you, um, how do you recommend someone start to find a teacher? According to the condition of the students, he will attract by his intuition, in intuition that is available for you according to his condition. He will attract the right teacher. The teacher will appear. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Okay. Yeah, as the student changes his mental pattern, automatically he's already psychically in contact with the next guru. <laughs> Uh, Sri Dharma, I have one more question for you, and it's a silly question. Silly question. What is your favorite joke to tell in class? Oh, I like jokes. <laughs> I usually play jokes. A yogi become like a child. In order to enter the kingdom of God, we have to become like a child. I like the joke that deal with. Four. <laughs> I do 